All right. The first book I've finished for July is 100 Years of Solitude by Gabriel Garcia Marquez. And it was weird. <laughs> so I read this because I'm doing this, um, this library reading challenge over the summer. And it's kind of this travel the world reading challenge. And one of the kind of additional, I don't know, challenges besides just reading a certain number of books and like you get a raffle ticket for every book, but it's also to read books that are set in all these different continents. And they basically have all seven continents plus a fantasy continent, so woohoo. But basically I looked at that and was like, well shit, I never read anything that's set in the <laughs> in anywhere. It's not true, but okay. And this was the first book that came to my mind as something that I thought was probably set in South America. I'm like still not 100% sure on that because um, Marquez, or Garcia Marquez, I guess, um, was from Colombia, and I am about to embarrass myself and admit that I'm not entirely sure where Colombia is. It's either in South America or like in that like zone in between South America and Mexico, like the neutral zone. <laughs> That's what we should start calling it. No, I, it's somewhere there. Yeah, I could look at a map. But I went, I think this book is set in South America and it's close enough and I'm counting it. Yeah, and then I, but I didn't know where he was from. I was just like, I'm pretty sure he's not a Mexican author. And then I was reading it and then I was like, well, they speak Spanish, so probably not Portuguese, not, sorry, not, um, not Brazil. And then I was guessing, anyway, nobody needs to hear about how I don't know anything about like one of the most well-known Latin American authors uh, ever. <sighs> Embarrassment. But anyway, this is a very weird book. It's from the 60s and it's like late 60s and it's like um, very surreal and it's got magical realism and it basically follows this family that live in this little town that they found somewhere. They never actually say where any of this is taking place. But um, it's near Riohacha. I listen, I listened to it, so I'm just doing my best here. <laughs> Which might be a real place. I don't know. Riohacha, like like a river. I don't know. Listen, it doesn't it's fine. That's that's whatever. That's the name of a city that they mention. But it's this town and it gets founded by this group of people who just decide let's just go across like the mountains and let's just try and find the ocean and they fail to find the ocean and they wander around for several years and they found this town and it's by some swamps i don't know and it's a god it, this is just such a strange book it just follows this family and half of them are named jose Acardi, acardio oh boy that's not right and buendia jose acardio buendia and then and Aureliano and Remedios. Like a lot of the names just repeat. And then I, I just got to a point by the end, it was like, I don't remember how these people are related. Like, because also people will have kids and then the kid will get raised by someone else. And then I'm in the family and I'm like, I am confusion. There's also just, just, just weird shit in this book. Like not only is there magical realism, so there's like ghosts, there's like this one guy who's always followed around by butterflies, stuff like that. Um, there's also, there's weird sex stuff that I didn't really appreciate. Some of which is just like, yikes. Um, there was some incest stuff, which was, I guess, kind of interesting. Like, I don't really care about that. I was most distressed by the character who falls in love with and marries a nine-year-old. Just gonna leave that there. Yeah, when he's like a grown-ass adult, to be clear, he's not nine. And I was like, hi, I hate this. Why am I reading this? And then she got accidentally poisoned when one of the sisters was trying to poison the other sister. <sighs> Ugh. Anyway, I hate it, I hate it, I hate it, I hate it. But that was the thing for me, that was the line. Everything else I was like, fine, whatever. Oh, you wanna fuck your aunt? Fine, whatever. But like, <laughs> that was just like, okay, I don't like this. Um. Oh, there was just, it was, it was so odd. And it, the way that it's told is very like, like someone's telling you a story, I guess. Um, 
and it just keeps going and going and going and going. Like there are no chapter breaks. We just go forever and always. And uh, characters live for like unreasonable amounts of time. Uh, strange things keep happening. I mean, it took me a while, but I did get into it eventually. I was like, all right, I can go with the flow of this. Like when I started it, I was expecting like a plot. <laughs> I was expecting an actual story. And I was trying to keep all the characters straight. Eventually I just gave up on all that and was like, all right, we're just, we're taking the journey, you know, and it's fine. And it was fine. Um, I can't say that I liked it that much, but I can kind of see something, I guess. <laughs> but uh, now I'm not saying I would never read another book by him. I probably would. I think he also read, did he write, why am I asking like someone's going to answer? I think he wrote Death in the Time of Cholera or Love in the Time of Cholera. Is that the title? Fuck. I don't know. Love in the Time of Cholera. Maybe. Uh, anyway, you know what? It was a fine book and it wasn't really my thing, but I experienced it. Okay. And I got to check South America off my list. So that's truly what matters. <laughs> Terrible. But, you know, literary fiction, magical realism, that kind of stuff just isn't really my thing. I'm over here like, okay, it's been too long since I've read a proper science fiction book. What am I doing? So I'm remedying that now. But, um, yeah, I think I'm, I think I'm good. And I, it gets July off to a good start anyway, because I already finished a book. Right, hello. I have finished reading The Left Hand of Darkness by Ursula K. Le Guin. This is a reread for me because I've read this book before, but it's been a while. I mean, I last read it before I even went to graduate school and that was like, um, yeah, let's not talk about how long ago I read this book. Okay. <laughs> hmm. Um, I love this book, right? Like, it's, it's a favorite of mine. It's, it's a book I think of very fondly. And I would basically forgotten the plot. Like this happens to me a lot. I, I don't retain a lot of details of the books that I read, um, you know, years after the fact, unless it's something that I've read several times or maybe something like very shocking. I don't know, like I'll remember certain aspects. For example, it's been even longer since I've read Ender's Game and I'm never going to forget the twist at the end, which is kind of sucks because I will never get to re-experience discovering it, I guess. But like a lot of the rest of the plot of most books, like I won't remember. It'll just be little bits and pieces or I'll remember like vaguely what it's about. So in the case of The Left Handed Art, let's just fucking talk about it, okay? I love this book. It's wonderful. It's um part of her Hainish Cycle, which if you've never read any of that and you're like, oh, it's a whole series, right? It isn't really like you don't have to read them in order. You don't have to read all of them. They're just set in the same universe. And a planet in one might be mentioned in another. I'm not even sure there's a full continuity of like, I don't, you know, I don't, I think there's probably contradictions. Like you really just need to know that they're all set in the same universe. And that's basically all that matters. I have not read all of them. Um, I think the first couple are some of her older books, of course, obviously, and she improves. So like, I, I prefer, I'm not, I'm not that interested in reading her earlier books, I guess, but this is, you know, this is still from the late sixties, so it's not exactly new. Um, but I love this book so much. Okay, so this is about a representative of the um, of the ecumen, which is like this big government in space. It's kind of like a space UN. And, uh, they've sent him as a representative to this planet called Gethin or winter. And, um, it's called that because it's frozen. Like it's a very cold planet. It, their, their summer lasts like three weeks. Like there's always tons of snow and it's really cold all the time. Um, and he's supposed to explain the concept of the ecumenical whatever. And he's supposed to like 
get some of the nations of the planet to want to join this this group and um yeah so he goes about doing that and he's been on the planet for about two years by the time this book starts and uh basically in this book um this prime minister of high level official that he's been interacting with um Ha, gets him his audience with the king finally and then is kind of immediately exiled and like in a ton of trouble all of a sudden and then that's kind of awkward and Genli, his name is Genli, no it's not. What is it? <laughs> Hang on. Yes, Genli I. Sorry, I get confused because all of the characters in this book call him Genri if they call him by his first name because they can't pronounce L's. So, so I'm just like, is it Genli or is it Genri? Okay, it's Genli I. And he's from Earth and, um, God, I'm explaining way too much backstory. I've been talking for so long already. Um, this book has a lot of traveling in it. The big chunk of the book that's the most memorable to me is this entire portion where that prime, former prime minister, Estravan and Genli travel together across the ice sheets because they're in this other country and they need to get back to the first country and it's a whole thing. But they travel together over this ice sheet for like several months and I really like that kind of story where a couple of characters travel a long distance in extreme circumstances and are surviving this very intense like the weather is a lie you know they're they're met with setbacks in their journey and the two of them become closer over the course of that there's a lot of interesting like gender stuff in this book i think that's what it's most known for um because the people of geffen have a very different like way that they do procreation than humans do even though they are otherwise entirely like humans um but for whatever reason they have this different thing and so what they they are all the they have this um this like mating cycle which once a month they go into um and then basically if they kind of jam with somebody else who's doing it they can at that point make a baby so basically like they spend all of their time as kind of an androgynous being except at this very specific moment when they then differentiate into either male or female together as part of a couple and then they can have a baby and so like so they have a very different just structure of what gender is they don't really have gender and it's it's interesting to see Genli like grapple with that because he's kind of sexist, honestly. And he he's always just kind of like spends a lot of time thinking like, well, thinking of people as men or women, or should I think of them that way or not, you know, and like he often if a character has some sort of more feminine trait, it's a negative in his eyes makes them less trustworthy and stuff but he has kind of a journey in the book where he finally comes to a moment that's so lovely where he recognizes Estravan specifically as like an individual person who is both a man and a woman and like I don't know it just in the book it really like works well as like this moment of finally seeing him fully I don't know whatever i love this book i can <laughs> i cannot express but i think it's lovely it's yeah ursula k Le Guin writes just wonderful science fiction of a particular sort and i am a big fan of space operas and lots of like battles and violence and aliens and just a lot of nonsense happening which is not really at all what she writes but what she writes is wonderful and really looks at like who, what are people when it comes down to it in these different worlds and like it's just it's just really good i i think um i think science fiction fans in general should read this book also i hate this edition uh i just think it's really ugly 
fun fact. But I bought it at Half Price Books and the point is the words inside, not the cover, right? I just hate that it's three different pictures of the, it's the exact same picture in all of them. What, I, I don't like this. I understand why you would be like, let's make the book white and put a glacier or a whatever the fuck this is. I guess it's an iceberg on here. I get that, I get the logic, but like, I don't like it. Anyway, I've been talking for far too long, um, but I just really love this book. I finished reading Wild Rover No More by L.A. Meyer. Book 12 of the Bloody Jack Adventure series and the final book and now I'm done and my reread slash finishing out of the series is over. I really liked this one. I thought it was a good ending to the series and um, of course naturally that means I'm also sad that it is the ending to the series. I very much wish there were going to be more but there's not, so that sucks. Um, and yeah, I think that's that's about good because I've, I've made a video for those the last two books, you know, a reading vlog as usual for my Bloody Jack adventure. adventure. Uh, and that, I'm gonna say that should be up before this one because I think that should actually be true since I am done filming it. Uh, but, you know, God knows, because with me, it, it might not be, <laughs> but it probably is. But anyway, so I'm not going to say much about it here, just that I did like it a lot. All right, hello. I finished Becoming Superman by J. Michael Straczynski. My journey from poverty to Hollywood with stops along the way at murder, madness, mayhem, movie stars, cults, slums, sociopaths, and war crimes. And he's not kidding. This is a great book. Like, absolutely thought it was fantastic. It's a memoir, obviously, kind of an autobiography, I guess. I'm not sure what the difference is. And, uh, yeah, it, it, this specifies who the fuck he is, which I know because Babylon 5 is my favorite thing on this planet Earth, but um, JMS wrote Babylon 5, created Babylon 5 and Sense8, and he had a run on Spider-Man. He wrote the movie Changeling that I've never seen. He has been in every conceivable kind of writing type of thing. Uh, in the last, you know, 30, 40 years, I guess. And uh, yeah, this is a very interesting book. Half of it, of course, is like how he got into writing, how he had one project which then went well or another project went really badly and all the different people he's worked with and stories about people like like Harlan Ellison or the various actors on Babylon 5 and kind of what happened to some of them and the other half, the first half, is about JMS's like childhood and his family history which is all completely fascinating uh, if you really like looking at train wrecks. Okay, I don't, I don't, I'm not, I'm gonna be mean. I won't be mean. It's not mean. He his family, um, completely terrible people, all of them, the, the lot of them. Maybe his sisters are fine, I guess, but like his grandparents, his parents, all garbage human beings doing terrible things to each other for decades upon decades. I mean, every time you think it can't get worse, it does. Like every time you're like, oh, okay, so you know, this guy is a terrible, violent alcoholic. Could this get worse? Oh, it does, don't worry. Don't worry, it gets worse. The only time it stops getting worse is when the book ends, so, God. I mean, there is Nazi bullshit in here, which I feel like that's kind of the lowest of the low, but there is like, there's incest. There is um, a lot of abuse, just a lot of very unpleasant things. Um, 
which I went into the book not, not really knowing kind of the depths that some of these individuals plumbed to be like as the worst people possible. Um, but now I do. But anyway, just it's really an interesting thing to watch kind of to read about um, Straczynski going through all of this and how he, you know, and then how did he get out of that, I guess. And what, oh God, and I think it's just as a fan of Babylon 5, some of it was very interesting that didn't even directly relate to the show, because there are several chapters where he actually talks about the show itself, but um, just things where he'll be talking about like, like the cycle of violence and abuse, where I'm sitting there like, this is shit Jakar talked about. Like, these are things that he put into the words of his characters just brilliantly, so. Anyway, this is a very good book. Um, yeah, it, it really is. And it's just, it's interesting also just to read about all the different industries of writing that he's worked in, like television, animation. He talks about like the, the way that it's censored and how obnoxious that is. <laughs> and oh, the sheer number of TV shows that he has just quit and how somehow, somehow he keeps getting work again. And just like, just the amazing kind of like journey that he has had from, you know, trying to get into writing when he was like in college through to actually going to Cannes for his movie Changeling. And, which I've never seen, did I mention that? I don't, it sounds interesting because apparently it's based on this like actual case and this woman, her, um, in like the, gosh, I think it was the 30s. Don't quote me though. In Los Angeles and her son was kidnapped and the police returned her son to her, but she's like, this is not my child. And it was not her child. And then they would not admit that they were wrong. They put her in an institution. So it sounds fascinating. So maybe like Clint Eastwood directed this. Maybe I will watch it. I don't know. If I run across it, probably. Um, but it's a, it's a good book. It's a very good book. Um, it really is like I like the way it's written too it's like very engaging very easy to read and pretty funny at times like for all that it's dark as shit like there are some lines that just made me laugh like a lot and um <laughs> the back sorry I wasn't looking at the the cover because I took it off while I was reading it so like Superman boots it's cute, like the whole, it's becoming Superman because when he was a kid, he read comic books and he really looked up to Superman and he was just like, that's the kind of person I want to be. And yeah, so, and I like that too. I like the aspect of just being like, listen, the reason that people write and the things that we get out of the things that we read. Yeah, so. I, yeah. I just, I thought it was very good. And like, the thing is autobiography is just not really something I read much, but as soon as I heard that J. Michael Straczynski had written one, I was like, intriguing, tell me more. And then I read a review of it. I think it was probably on Vox, um, but I'm not sure. It might've been frankly anywhere, I don't know. It was somewhere and they were talking about it and I was like, oh, it's good, okay. So yeah, got it for Christmas and I am so happy to have read it, and uh, I think I think I would, I, you know, I recommend it. Like, if you're at all interested in, in TV writers, or even in just, like, writers in general, or in JMS specifically, or, you know, in reading about somebody really, like, just hugely changing their life and doing something amazing um, and being very successful, but in a very much, like, tons of hard work was required kind of way. I'd recommend this. All right, I finished The City of Brass by S.A. Chakraborty. This is a book, oh my God, okay. <laughs> so this is a fantasy book. Um, this is basically just like the next fantasy trilogy I'm interested in reading, so I decided to finally start it. Absolutely stunning cover, I don't know if you can see it, but like, it's just so pretty, and like, this is really pretty. <laughs> so this is just a gorgeous book, but anyway, that's not important. This is also pretty. I'm just very into these patterns. 
Um, okay, so this book. It took me a, a little while to get into it. I, I kind of was struggling, but finally there was more focus on stuff going on in Devabad, which is this city. I should probably explain what this book's about. Okay, it's about this young woman who's living in Cairo and she like accidentally summons a fucking djinn one day. And then there are all these like demons or something trying to kill her. I'm not like super up on all this terminology, but Ifrit do seem particularly demonic to me. Um, I guess demon is a much more like Christian term, but anyway, whatever. It's Ifrit are trying to kill her and this D Jin saves her. Oh, but don't call him a Jin because he's I, I hate this guy, by the way. We can talk about that in a second. But anyway, so he drags her to Devabad, which is like this um, Jin city. It's it's not the only one, but it's the one that matters to him, I guess. So, okay. And it's kind of roughly in the, I guess, Afghanistan air, area. Oh, no, that's not right. It's over here. Um, maybe that's more Pakistan. I, this map does not have line, borders on it, so it's kind of, and I'm not like that familiar with the area, but that's like Pakistan, Afghanistan-ish, right? Like this, Devabad. Anyway, because they never say precisely kind of what country it's in, even though I guess she doesn't really know, but also this book is set in the 18-something or others. Like Napoleon is having a war, so, and I think has recently taken over Egypt. So I'm like, I don't know when that happened, but the early 1800s. Um, uh, anyway, Devabad. So they're in Devabad and it's just like, it's a lot of drama and it turns out that she might be the daughter of this, this really powerful healer woman who was part of, who was like, she and her brother were the last two members of this really powerful healer family uh, that used to be like, there's, there's a lot of politics. I don't even want to get into it. But basically, there's just like hundreds and thousands of years worth of like, these people were in this and these people took over and then these people committed atrocities. And then, you know, and everyone hates like, okay, it's it, what I think is interesting is you've got all the several different factions who have all done terrible things to each other, and who all suck. And yeah, like, <laughs> I don't know, genuinely, if at any point, you're supposed to take a side. Um, but like, we're definitely seeing more of kind of, at the very end of the book, it's like, ooh, there's some plottings that have been going on with the devas, like in the background that we haven't been privy to, who are definitely just using Nari for their own ends and using other characters as well for their own ends. And that's interesting. So it is interesting. My favorite character is Ali, who is the second son of the king um, and their whole thing is like basically a while back, uh, their ancestor who was from, uh, Saudi Arabia, roughly. Oh yeah. And also I guess I should say all of these people are Jinn and there's a whole really long history there, but at some point all of the different Jinn were kind of like split up and dumped in all these different parts of Northern Africa slash the Middle East slash Asia. And have kind of their own so they're all these individual groups of them that have their own like cultures and languages and stuff so his this guy's ancestor was from from like Saudi Arabia area and they ended up taking over the city of Devabad and so now generations later okay so his father's the king of Devabad and he is um the second son and he's been like training to be a warrior and stuff. And he's my favorite character because like, <sighs> what are my choices, right? Like, I don't like Dara. I'm just gonna come out with it. Cause like, I feel like this is, I've heard about this book a lot in booktube. I don't know who people like, but uh, I'm just gonna say that I don't like Dara. And like, I wanted to, I guess, but he never gave me a reason to. You know, I mean, listen, he's over here with all of his like sad story and his trauma. And I'm like, listen, I, I am into that. Like, I like that in a character, but he's also just a racist D-bag like all the time. I don't care what they did to your family a thousand years ago, bruh. Like, 
you can stop it with the in-book universe racial slurs. But anyway, <clears throat> so yes, I picked a side and that side is that I don't like the Devas very much. <laughs> It's like, oh, it's their city. I'm like, you know what, bitch, get over it. It's been a long time. A lot of other people are also living there. <sighs> but also, like, listen, <laughs> the the uh, the Katanis, the 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 royal family, aren't that great. But I mean, I like Ali a lot, so yeah, he's my favorite. I clearly have a lot of opinions. I haven't even fucking mentioned the main character Nari, who is the, the young woman I mentioned at the beginning. She matters. Um, but my opinions on her are just kind of like, she's there. I think she's growing on me. I do like her more at the end. More fun and more interesting by the end, I guess. Like, it's not like I dislike her at any point. Just, she's like, she's just kind of that kind of character, you know, who doesn't know all of the intricacies and shit. Because she's not from this city. She doesn't know all of their stuff. Um, so really, it's the point that she becomes more interesting to me is the point where she decides to take more agency over what's going on because all of these different forces are pulling her in these different directions of course but she has a point where she's kind of like i'm going to start working for myself and I'm like yes that's interesting um just kind of going along like Ugh, is not interesting but you know she moved on beyond that i guess clearly i have a lot of thoughts and feelings um and i definitely want to keep reading the series and i definitely will so yeah but um Anyway, I don't like Dara, I do like Ali. If there's a love, like I, there isn't really a love triangle, but I sense that those are the, those are the options, right? They're definitely <laughs> presented that way in the book, but also like within the fandom, I can, I, I can, I just have a sense that those are the arguments that go on, even though I've not seen them. And I'm like, Ali's better at the end. So, um, yeah. I don't know, sorry, it's just Dara just, he just, he just hits kind of that, that feeling for me of like a character who has been through terrible things, who has done terrible things, who blames the terrible things he has done on other people. And it's like, no. Although admittedly with the whole gin thing and the slavery thing and the, it's possible that he did a lot of things actually involuntarily, but I'm just kind of gonna wait and see where this goes, right? Like. My opinions on him could change, but right now I'm like, Nar N Nari? Yeah, Nari. Stay away from that dude, okay? Stay away from him. Um, okay, I'm done. I'm done. But anyway, I liked it, and um, also, yeah, never mind. I don't have anything else to say. I'm gonna stop. Uh, yeah, I'm gonna stop, and um, I do want to read the sequel. You know that. I said that. I'm gonna shut up. Thank you. Goodbye.